admittedly, I don't remember much from chemistry class back in 1994, although I had the best chemistry teacher, one of my favorite teachers in all of high school. So I will not tell him, but I could not remember the meaning of Boyle's Law, which caught my attention because one writer said that Boyle's Law is like packing your luggage for a long vacation. That apparently the meaning of Boyle's Law states that at a constant temperature, the pressure on a gas varies inversely with the volume of the gas. So less pressure, more volume that the gas will expand to fill the space that is available. So the bigger the luggage, the more we pack. The more zipper pockets all around the luggage, we more we feel like we've got to cram into them. The only problem is we have to then carry the luggage around <laughs> that our backs and our shoulders pay the price. We have to bear the weight of what we take. And it's not until we return home that we realize we didn't need half the stuff in our bag. We never took it out. All we did was carry it around. <laughs> There's a similar sentiment that leaps off of the page from the book of Ecclesiastes as it talks about the vanity of all vanities. But it's a very different kind of vanity than what we find when we stand in front of the mirror a little too long. That it is sowing without reaping. It is work without purpose. It is labor without results. It is carrying our luggage around even though we don't need half of what is in it. That it is, as Ecclesiastes says, what do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? It's vanity of all vanity. That for all of our hard work, what exactly do we accomplish? That we get up early on Monday morning, we ignore the snooze button and get fast to work because throughout the week, we've got to pay the bills, do the laundry, go by the grocery store, mow the lawn, only to do it again the next week that we not only feel sympathy for the hamster running on the wheel, we also feel empathy. We know exactly how it feels that our legs are tired as well. It is that moment when we realize for all of our hard work, we are not in control. And if you have not been around a toddler in quite some time, you might not remember that we are not in control. We only think that we are in charge. But no matter how many times you pick the sippy cup off the ground, it is thrown down yet again. No matter how many times you say, all right, it's bedtime. It is a grit your teeth, white knuckled negotiation to get the pajamas on that you might have thought you were a patient person until you lose a toddler in the midst of a crowd of people and fear takes over. That control is an illusion. And when we find ourselves feeling as if we are working without purpose or laboring without results, we realize we are not 
in control. And we might wonder, what is the point? And it's at that moment that we might want to slam the book of Ecclesiastes shut and just go back to our illusion of being in control because it's just easier that way. But before we close the book of Ecclesiastes, we have to remember it's not where the argument begins, it's where the argument ends that truly matters. That it's like backing up a trailer. My dad taught me how to back a boat into the lake slowly navigating it down the boat ramp where there's only so much margin for error. And he says, all right, when you turn the steering wheel to the right, the trailer's going to go to the left. And when you turn the steering wheel to the left, the trailer's going to go to the right. That it's not what you expect. And it seems as if the book of Ecclesiastes is leading us in the direction of despair. When it might be leading us somewhere else altogether. Because when we realize that we are not in control, our other option is contentment. That it is, as Sarah Lewis writes, we live in a world that embodies that African proverb. We want to eat dinner in the morning. We don't want to wait. We want it right now. But our other option is contentment, that we can wait because we have what we need for the given moment. And we don't have to panic because we have strength enough for this day. And that we can work without disappointment because we are content in the simple joy of right now. Now I know that in this world, there are many people who live day in and day out with the burden of poverty and oppression. And discontentment is absolutely essential. But for many of us, we can practice contentment instead of chasing the vanity of all vanities. Someone in the crowd went up to Jesus and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me which doesn't sound like a question. It doesn't even sound like a suggestion. And Jesus doesn't respond, except to offer a word of caution. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. But there was this landowner who had an abundance of harvest. Everyone wanted to know what his secret was, but he could not figure out what to do with it, that it would not fit in the current barn. So he decided, I'm going to tear that barn down and build a bigger one. That apparently, Boyle's law applies to barns as well that he didn't know there was another option. 
just to fill the current barn, which had always been enough, and to use the abundance in a different way. And when we listen to many of the contemporary voices in the church describe Jesus, we might not assume that he cautioned against greed. But Jesus is trying to teach us the word enough. That Jesus is trying to teach the practice of contentment. Because life does not always move from point A to point B, especially in a straight line. Last summer, we went to see Shakespeare in the Park, a performance of A Midsummer's Night Dream. And it was there on the campus of Montana State University, right next to this beautiful duck pond and these large trees all around. And we had set up our blanket and our chairs. And then we looked up and we noticed this dark cloud starting to form. And we looked around and nobody panicked. Nobody was leaving. So we followed suit. And then it started to sprinkle. And we looked around again and we thought, well, nobody's leaving. The poor performers are still handing out programs. So we stayed but then it started to pour. And we looked at one another and we go, it's time to go. And we scooped up the chairs and the blanket and I ran to go get the car as they took all of those things to hide under cover from the rain. And I pulled up in the car and they jumped in and shook off the rain. And as we were pulling away, Catherine says, you know, while we were standing other cover, there was this, uh, elderly woman standing next to me under one arm she had a chair and under the other arm she had her small dog and she looked at me and she goes well it was a good idea <laughs> and there are countless good ideas in this world but unfortunately They do not always work out. It's the letter that regrets to inform us that we were not accepted. It is getting to school early in the morning before the first bell to check that list next to the coach's office to discover we didn't make the team. It's feeling like the job interview went perfectly, only to hear the voicemail at home to say, we were not hired. It's the surprise opportunity that we cannot afford. It's that lingering feeling in the background of our lives that we are left out or left behind. It's that dream that seems to come into focus only to fall apart. That it is, as Wendell Berry writes, we live the given life, not the planned. That life does not move from point A to point B. It moves through every single letter of the alphabet and not necessarily in order. That we have to learn to embrace life as it is, where we are not always wishing for the life that we do not have. For it is in contentment that we discover.
God's abundance despite the fact that we are not in control. Amen.